Hello, I'm Michael Brown, Master's of Science in Healthcare Management Class of 2007 and current chair of the Alumni Weekend Committee. Welcome to our lightning talks, short talks given by alumni, which are an opportunity to hear stories from one another. And this year we have chosen to share alumni stories about their response to the COVID-19 crisis. Bethany Heitkutz-Gautier is an Associate Professor of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard School of Public Health and Biostatistics at Harvard Chan School, specializing in health systems research, primarily in the Sub-Saharan Africa. She graduated with a PhD in Biostatistics from Harvard Chan in 2008 and completed a postdoctoral fellowship in the same department in 2010. Dr. Heitkutz-Gautier leads a portfolio of work in global surgery with a focus on access to safe and affordable cesarean sections in rural district hospitals in Rwanda. She also leads work on equity in global health partnerships and specifically on the role of academic institutions in high-income high countries in addressing the field of global health's power imbalances. Bethany? Thank you, Michael, and to the Alumni Association for the invitation. Um, you know, my hope is by sharing this work with this group that it will generate some conversation, some response. I definitely think this is a work in progress and has room to grow and improve. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, in preparation for, for today, I had a fun trip down memory lane, um, thinking about my time at Harvard Chan um, and just how instrumental those years as a student at Harvard Chan have been for the work that I'm going to talk, going to talk about today. And that's both in the methods that I use for the work. So a lot of what I studied in my PhD thesis are methods that we're using as part of our COVID-19 response. And it's interesting to see it have its moment in this current pandemic. Um, but also in the relationships that I formed. And, and I partic picked these particular photos from my thesis defense and graduation because a lot of the classmates and faculty that are featured here are individuals that I've been in touch with over the last seven months that have given input to this work or helped shape what we're doing. So I really just want to acknowledge my time at Harvard um, and Harvard Chain specifically as, as being instrumental for this work. Before I jump into what we're doing with COVID, um, it for me is important to recognize that seven months ago, we weren't doing anything, or I personally wasn't doing anything related to COVID-19. And so what was I doing in February of 2020? And as described in the introduction, I was leading two bodies of work. One was a body of work related to providing high quality, equitable healthcare um, in around the world, but largely in Sub-Saharan Africa. And then a second body of work that I support is related to how we partner in global health and specifically the relationship between academics in high income countries and our collaborators in low and middle income countries, the power dynamics in those relationships and how do we strive towards equity in those collaborations. If you wanted to look at one paper that summarizes both of those bodies of work, I wanna point you to this one that we wrote last year that talks about how we've grown a portfolio of global surgery research in Rwanda, really investing in our partnerships between colleagues at Harvard and colleagues at Partners in Health Rwanda, um, the Ministry of Health and the University of Global Health Equity. And as Michael also mentioned in the introduction, my applied research is largely related to cesarean sections. And it's not just around the surgery itself, but it's around the whole health systems and how do we make sure that from um, conception all the way through recovery from C-section that women have access to care that is both safe and affordable um, for her optimal outcomes. To be able to do this work, I am a member of what we call the Global Health Delivery Partnership. And the heart of that partnership is an organization called Partners in Health, which is a non-governmental organization that's been around for over 30 years, supporting healthcare delivery in multiple countries. And the department I sit in, Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, is the academic sister to Partners in Health. And so a lot of what we do um, both in the department and then as part of the Global Health Research Corps is to support um, 
our research to better understand the, the challenges and successes of programs that we're supporting in Partners in Health with a goal of improving, but also replicating success in other settings. And then a third part of the partnership is the Division of Global Health Equity, which provides a lot of the clinical insight into the work that we do. And as I mentioned, Partners in Health, which really is the heart of a lot of the work um, that we support in our department, has programs across multiple countries. And the countries that I'll talk about in the work that we're doing related to COVID-19 um, are the countries that are supported by PIH. So then what happened in March um, 2020? And as I was preparing the slide, I started the heading as what were the challenges that the low and middle income countries that we were supporting as part of Partners in Health, what were the challenges that they were facing related to COVID-19? But then I realized that the bullets for this um, are not just specific to low and middle income countries. It's really the challenges that we've been facing globally. In March of 2020, and even now in September of 2020, there's still really limited information and constantly evolving information on the epidemiology of um, novel coronavirus and how it affects the population. So who's at risk and you know, what does morbidity look like? These are constantly moving targets and why um, you know, the intervention responses have seemed to change daily. Um, so that's definitely a challenge that our partner sites are facing. Um, limited data, again, I think that's a global challenge. One issue that I think particularly affects the countries that we support is issues around testing capacity. So access to good high quality tests has been a global challenge. It is more acute in some of the countries that we support because the testing infrastructure in general may have been more limited going into March of 2020 and because of the global hustle to get access to tests has really led to shutting out um, a lot of our partner sites or the countries that they're working in um, from the global market for testing. And so that might be something more acutely felt, but it's definitely a global challenge related to COVID-19. And then finally, a universal challenge that our sites are not immune from are the secondary effects of containment and treatment programs. And so um, how are we adequately preventing disease while not exasperating other issues that we have um, ongoing in the, the systems where we work? So to try and support the sites with Partners in Health um, with their questions related to COVID-19, two colleagues, um, Jean-Claude Magunga, who's the Deputy Chief Medical Officer at Partners in Health, and Megan Murray, who is a professor at Harvard Medical School and the Director of Research for Partners in Health, convened a cross-site research group um, with the focus of COVID-19. So this group, which is pictured here from one of our weekly Zoom calls, um, we meet to discuss um, the common and core questions that our sites have that we can work on together. Um, once we've identified these, we've been working to develop rigorous methods that are contextually appropriate to answer these questions. And I'll give you some examples of those methods um, in the talk. And then we work collaboratively to implement these methods and then share the results and lessons learned across our sites. And so this core group is really meant to bring um, centralized resources and make them available for sites to have the most effective methods for their program response. Early on, these were the three um, questions that we identified as the top priorities um, for the sites. So the first question just is generally, what is the burden of COVID-19? And looking at the variability of that burden across countries and within countries that we support. Um, how is COVID-19 directly affecting health, particularly in high-risk groups? Again, in March of 2020 and even now, there's some particular high-risk um, or comorbidities in the countries that we support that there's not a lot of data on. There's not a lot of data of differential risk for people who are infected with HIV, people who have malaria, people who are malnourished. And so trying to understand um, COVID-19 and these high-risk groups where there was limited epidemiology um, was of particular importance. And then finally, understanding how COVID-19 is affecting care and outcomes across the health system, um, both directly and indirectly as part of the response. 
So I'm going to give two examples. Um, the two examples I'm going to give probably represents about 50% of the work that we are working on. Um, before I give these two examples, I want to acknowledge that what I'm representing here has been work that's been touched and improved and evolved by dozens and dozens of individuals. And so I highlight here our colleagues who are um, shaping these methods, giving technical input, who are implementing these methods, improving them. Um, and I want to give particular note to two um, Harvard Chan alumni who graduated in the last two years, Del Barnhart, who graduated from the epidemiology program, um, and Izzy Fulcher, who graduated from the biostatistics program, that are postdoctoral fellows that are leading the methods development for the work that I'm going to present today. And as part of that, they're leading a team of student interns from a variety of institutions that are doing a lot of the behind the scenes work. So um, it really has been a collective effort and investment of which I happen to be one person who's talking about it. And I just want to acknowledge that before I move forward. So one of the two examples I want to highlight are the cohort study work. And this is largely led by Dale Barnhart. Um, as one example of cohort studies, we're looking at establishing um, cohorts of contacts. So contacts are individuals who are identified um, through contact tracing efforts. And in the process of identifying um, contacts in these tracing efforts, there are brief surveys that are administered about particular comorbidities, so HIV status, NCD diagnoses, nutritional status, pregnancy status as examples. These individuals are then followed prospectively, and we look at them to try and understand, first, among um, those who go on to develop COVID, who is, um, are any of these risk factors putting them at higher risk of developing disease? And then amongst those who develop disease, trying to understand if those who have a particular risk factor have more severe, severe morbidity compared to the general population. And so we're able to follow um, these cohort of contacts to get a better understanding of disease risk in these high risk groups, particularly groups that there's not much information on otherwise. Another example is a historic control um, cohort design. And in this, what we're doing is we're using the electronic medical record systems that have been established by Partners in Health to follow chronic care patients. We're using that as a data source to identify um, the, the direct and indirect effects of COVID-19 on the chronic care patients. So we're looking at the patients and establishing um, what we would have expected to see in terms of frequency of visits and what happens at visits prior to COVID-19 and how that's changed after the implementation of distancing and isolation strategies for prevention of spread. And then we're also looking at in those care changes, have we been able to maintain the successful outcomes that we saw prior? Or are we seeing um, decreases in, in things like retention or um, successful and thriving um, care in these programs as a result? And so these are designs that will be forthcoming, results, results will be forthcoming in the next few months as we look at the, the impact of COVID-19 on care and outcomes for these patients. We are not at all prescriptive in any of these designs for any of our sites. So what we've done is come up with what we call a research menu. So there's actually five different designs that we've made available through this core, um, core group. And each of the sites can then decide which of these designs, one, they're the most interested in, and two, they think are the most feasible within the context of their programs. And so they pick and choose from the different cohort designs. And then even within a cohort design, they can pick and choose what disease areas they want to focus on. And so, for example, a country like Haiti might say, we can do a cohort of contacts, um, but we can't study HIV in that because we can't ascertain HIV status as we're asking about um, their risk exposures. Or a country like Rwanda might say, well, we don't have the data available from the contact tracing because that's done through a centralized system that we don't have direct access to. And so this is really meant to be 
a resource for countries to pick and choose what's the most appropriate and of interest to them. And then once they decide, we have the centralized team that's helping pull together protocols for IRB approvals, um, to centralize data cleaning, and to provide results back to sites based on, on their um, choices. A second area I want to highlight is the work related to syndromic surveillance, and this is the work that's being led by Isabel Fulcher. So for syndromic surveillance, um, what we're trying to do is monitor data on symptoms or outcomes that are related to COVID-19 rather than monitoring COVID-19 directly. And we recognize that in an ideal world, we would have um, the data and testing systems available to be able to monitor disease directly. But in the deficit of that data, um, looking at um, companion symptoms are a way that we can get some early indication of local outbreaks if there are any. And as a core for the syndromic surveillance, what we're using is um, the DHIS2 system. So most of the countries that we support have DHIS2, which is a centralized electronic system that collects data related to hundreds of indicators reported aggr aggregately on a monthly basis um, for each facility in the country. And so that's become the, the sort of basis of our um, syndromic surveillance work. So there's three steps in this um, process, high level steps. Um, the first is just getting the monthly data and preparing that data for the syndromic surveillance activity. Um, once we have that data prepped, then we are able to use the data up to 2020 to establish um, a trend of what we would expect, and that includes both a year term and a seasonal term, as many of the indicators that we're, we're looking at do have a seasonal component. And then the third step is to compare what we observe in post-January 2020 to what we expected based on the historical data. And so what we're looking for are any deviations from expected in terms of um, acute respiratory illness or non-malaria fever as an indication that there might be more disease circulating in a particular site than, than what we would have expected um, otherwise. So there's some nuance to how we're looking at this, and I just want to provide one example um, from Liberia. So this is an example um, of the number of acute respiratory illness cases, where if you look at um, in this, you look at what's happening post-2020, and there was an initial spike, but then it really was falling kind of within the, the range of what we thought was plausible based on historical trends. But one of the things the site noted was that overall there was a decrease in utilization. And so one of the questions was, well, what if we take into account the fact that people are not seeking care the way they used to because of the lockdown measures? And when we standardize and do a proportion of acute respiratory illness as um, standardized by the number of outpatient visits, we do see that the proportion of outpatient cases that are um, reported to have acute respiratory illness are significantly higher in these post-COVID periods, potentially indicating that there might be cause for concern of circulating virus in this population. So this is just one example of one indicator from one facility in Liberia. We have dozens of indicators that are COVID related um, that we're looking at in across multiple sites. Um, Liberia has about 400 sites reporting um, and then we have it for the, the different countries. So. Um, as part of that, um, the DHIS system, the countries aggregate the data, and most countries have a commitment to have that data entered into their centralized electronic systems by the 15th of the following month. And we have a process set in place now that can get the data from that electronic system. It goes through a relatively automated now data cleaning process, a relatively automated statistical modeling process, and then results produced. And the time from when we get the data to having results and meetings with sites to discuss the results that we see is a five day process. And so we really try to streamline this to make the data as readily available to sites as possible. 
One of the tools that we are using to support sites um, use of this data is um, uh, members of the team developed the Shiny app, which basically a site can choose a facility, choose an indicator, um, compare across indicators. So there's multiple ways that they can use the Shiny app to try and better understand what's happening in their country related to a specific indicator or a combination of indicators to, to um, use that as part of their response. So as the end of this talk, I want to give two plugs. Um, the first is for a talk that is next week, my time, but I think by the time this video is posted, it's going to be in the past, but I still want to plug it because this talk will go into a deeper dive of the methods for syndromic surveillance and also talk about how we're using those methods to just understand health service utilization during this post-COVID period. And this will be recorded and available online at the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine um, website at Harvard Medical School. And so for those of you who want to know more, I encourage you to go back in time and watch that video. Um, and the second plug that I want to make is for um, this website that we're developing. It's forthcoming, but it should be, our goal is to have it released by the 30th talk. So if you are interested in this, I would encourage you to go to that talk to find out the, the web link. Um, we have made a commitment that our goal is to support data-driven response in the countries who we support and that other countries who want to replicate that work, all of this is publicly available. And so by the 30th, we hope to have um, clean annotated code available to produce any of the syndromic surveillance apps, protocols for the cohort studies that other people can just download and adapt to their context so that it encourages use in other settings. So that, if you want to know more, those are the two places that I want to point you to, as well as um, always feel free to email me if you have questions, or I try to, as we have new developments in our work, um, to make sure that I'm updating that on Twitter so that folks that are following this more day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week can see some of the latest developments. So I put my Twitter handle there if you're interested to know more. So thank you. Well, thank you, Bethany. That's uh, such important work. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you uh, a few questions. Great. Should I stop You're screen sharing? Screen. Sorry. Do you want um, to? Sure. Either way. Okay. Your talk explained a great deal about the methods you're applying. Uh, are you prepared yet to discuss some of the more interesting findings that have come out of this research? Um, yes, we are. So I, I think that's an important observation. Um, you know, we have said from the beginning that these results are country facing. We were not doing this for the sake of a research endeavor. We were really trying to equip sites with the data that they needed for a response. And so to that end, um, these results have been made available to the audience for which they were intended and they are made available weekly on that cross-site call for us to share and learn from each other. And then we have monthly calls with, e with each of the sites. And so in that sense, um, results are, are produced and disseminated in the way that they were intended. Um, in terms of a more globally facing set of work, um, we have the, the talk coming up, we'll talk, do a deep dive into some of the immunization uptake changes that we've seen or not seen in various countries and trying to understand why some countries have sustained immunization rates while other countries have struggled. Um, so that will be sort of the more outward facing look of that work and will be followed by publications that we hope to share those lessons learned more broadly. Great. You talk about the individual countries. Can you talk about some of the policy changes that might have occurred in some of the countries based on the data that was available to them? Yeah, so a lot of the countries, um, you know, are talking about how as they prioritize like where they're looking for COVID-19, where they're scaling up testing, that especially the syndromic surveillance, which is giving some early indication, is helpful. Um, the health service utilization one has been a really interesting conversation as we dive into those, thinking about, um, you know, for example, we might in a particular country see a dip in immunization, and then they will go back and talk about um, are there complementary community methods that they have been doing or could be doing to try and make sure that even if people don't want to come to facilities, that they're still getting immunized in the community. So there's for all of these ongoing discussions about 
you know, what does this data mean and how does it affect how we move forward? Um, and again, each country will have different examples for how they're using that data to shape their response. Great. And a final question. Um, the collaborative work obviously has evolved because of COVID-19. What aspects of uh, what's changed do you think will be long-term changes now that you've discovered new ways of doing things? This is how it's going to be. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and interestingly, one that came up on our cross-site call, we were really diving into um, that immunization data ahead of next week's presentation and trying to understand what we were seeing and not seeing. And one of the responses from a colleague was, um, you know, this ability to look at data within 15 days of when it's produced. And it's just the whole process is automated now is something that he hoped would continue in the post COVID period, because we should be giving that closer look at facility delivery or immunization uptake or ANC care. We should be looking at it that regularly and responding to it that quickly even if we weren't in a COVID response. So I think just having that system, de we, that system development was accelerated by COVID, but it's something that we hope to keep in place and anticipate to keep in place post COVID. Another is just in how we've been collaborating. Um, you know, we set up this cross-site group again to facilitate resources and streamline resources and efforts related to COVID-19. But I think all of us are recognizing that there's a wealth of resources around the world. Um, there's certainly um, some technical resources that we can tap into centrally in Boston, um, but there's also expertise in methods, there's expertise in disease areas that sit, sit at sites. And so our intention is to broaden the scope of this cross-site group to be not COVID specific and that we can share the technical resources and the expertise across countries rather than it being done more centrally as it has traditionally been done in the past. Great. Well, thank you for all you do and thank you for sharing today. Thank you for taking the time. It's been fun.